Thank you. And no thanks for the scare, Lauren Baker. Uh, how are you doing? Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is our final, no, this is not our final. This is our first uh, iteration of the Far and Away series for 2021. So this is the, the third for the 2020-2021 series. And uh, today we're going to be hearing from performance artists Elliot Reed and Ron Athey. Uh, loud and clear. Good. Everyone hears. Uh, just to give you a little background on the series, I've done this every time, but uh, I think for some there's... Um, oh, I can get louder. Yes, that's better. Everyone says loud and clear, but this is even clearer and louder. Just to give you a little background on uh, how we've been doing this series. Uh, FAR, is, FAR, Facility for Arts Research, is made up of faculty from the FSU College of Fine Arts. That includes me uh, and the other co-directors, Denise Bookwalter and Judy Russian, and FAR's operations manager, Marty Fielding. Um, part of our mission, it's louder, Lauren. It's even louder. I can't get any louder. Uh, part of our mission is to uh, engender and support collaboration between artists and within these collaborative practices that the artists we're working with have. So one of the, way the, one of the ways that we've been doing that for years now is having this uh, visiting artist program that we call Far and Away. And the way that it works when we're not in the middle of a pandemic is that we are, bring people here to Tallahassee for about a week and we introduce them to uh, people in the FSU community and the surrounding community as a way to kind of extend their own collaborative practices and maybe spark some new collaboration that can last uh, long after they leave. So this year, obviously, we're doing things a bit differently and we've been producing this live stream. And the way that we essentially did it was to invite an artist to take part and then have them in turn uh, invite someone that they would like to be in conversation with. So um, before I even introduce who we're talking with tonight, uh, I want to give you a heads up for another event that's coming up uh, before we're all through. That's on March 23rd, and it's Related Tactics, Michelle Carlson, Western Teruya, uh, Nate Watson. And uh, this was rescheduled. We kind of switched... Um, today's event and this one, so make sure you are uh, ready for this. So um, tonight, performance artists Elliot Reed and Ron Athey. Uh, if you're watching this live on YouTube, um, looks like people are already active in the chat. Let us know how it's going. Let us know if there are any technical problems for sure. And uh, give us any of your questions or comments that you want to relay to uh, Elliot and Ron, and I will do that on your behalf. So let me give you a bit of kind of a resume of both Elliot and Ron. Elliot Reed is a performance artist and director based in New York City. His projects exist, exist between people, leveraging candid interaction amongst performers and audience. Utilizing a choreographic lens, Elliot assembles bodies, movement prompts, and narrative within exhibition space. As viewers move through his art, the narrative arc moves through them, unfurling itself in actual time. Uh, Elliot has been uh, the 2019 Dance Web Scholar, uh, artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem from 2019 to 2020, and recipient of the 2019 Rima Hort Mann Emerging Artist Grant, and has had exhibitions at uh, MoMA PS1, Getty Museum, Henry Museum, and so much more. Uh, Ron Athey was born on a submarine base December 16th, 1961. I'm intrigued to know <laughs> how, how, how the relevance of that, but it's intriguing. Uh, great way to start a bio. Uh, having spent most of his life in Los Angeles, his first performance project was Premature Ejaculation, a collaboration with Roz Williams uh, from 81 to 83, which included abject body rituals, costume, noise, and glossolalia, which is now my new favorite word. Um, Athey's work is closely associated with the AIDS pandemic from, 90, from 1990 to 1999. He performed and, uh, and toured internationally a trilogy of works with a core group of eight performers. 1999 kicked off the first solo performance, The Solar Anus, named after the same George Bataille essay, which was seen in over 20 venues across the world. Uh, we're excited to have both Elliot and Ron here with us and to have you, the audience, with us and in the chat and afterward when we get it all come all together between chat 
Ron and Elliot. Um, thank you so much for being here. And here are Ron, Ethy, and Elliot Reed. Hold on. Wait for it. Yeah, I wish I could be in Florida, but happy to be here. In the frozen. Okay. Uh, awesome. So I think the way that we're going to organize this evening is that uh, me and Ron are going to alternate taking turns talking about some of our work. So I'm going to start with a project I just finished here at MoMA PS1 in New York. Talk about the work. We'll have a brief talk back with me and Ron. Ron's going to talk about some of his projects, and I think we're going to open it up at the end for uh, any questions from the chat. Um, I think as uh, Rob mentioned earlier, people are gonna be reading the chat and pulling questions if you have any. So Rob, if you wanna pull up my first slide, so I can jump right in. Cool, so um, as you heard a little bit of in my bio, my background's primarily in performance, but this year um, with COVID has been a really exciting challenge in figuring out how to get work that comes from the body and comes from liveness and translating it into exhibition space. Um, so as the culmination, culminating exhibition for my residency at the Student Museum in Harlem, I made the show. Um, so the group show is called This Longing Vessel. I'm showing alongside artists Nadine, uh, Pierre, and E. Jane, and we each have our own rooms. So in my room, uh, it's based around some research that I was doing in Los Angeles before moving here about um, the murders of Jamel Moore and Timothy Dean by Ed Buck, who was a gay man living in West Hollywood who would lure black men uh, to his house and basically force feed them meth, like forcibly inject people, uh, because his fetish was basically getting these men to lose control of their bodies. Um, and unfortunately, Jamel Moore and Timothy Dean actually both died uh, within his house. So what was interesting to me about this story is beyond the fact that it took two people before any criminal charges were passed on Ed Buck, um, it really kind of illuminated a lot of other thoughts that I was having about sort of who is seen as a person of value within the eyes of the law and also what it means to kind of visit these traumatic spaces and sort of digest news through the internet sort of, it's the copy of the copy of the copy by the time it gets to us through our phones or computers or anywhere else. Um, so in this room right now um, on screen, you see the majority of my installation. Um, so on the back wall, there's a five panel video that I made in collaboration with Jack Quartet, which is an amazing string quartet here in New York City. And then I'm in the middle. Um, on the floor where you can see there's like a a little hole with light coming out of it is a performance called Hole, where I just broke uh, a piece of the wall of the museum open and lit it from behind. And then also the walls are an artwork too called Hue. And for that piece, I took a digital color scan of my right hand, which is my dominant hand, uh, and had that color translated into a hexadecimal that can be made into a paint and sort of metaphorically like stretched my skin along the walls of the gallery as a material. Um, so with the video installation and with the whole piece on the floor, you can almost think of it as like a scab or like a tear or something. The way that I installed the work, it's sort of like ripping through a layer of my reproduced flesh that's coating the walls. And then just uh, sort of in the middle of this image, you see a big uh, red square, which is a piece called Placeholder Series Number 1, Nudity. Um, I'll t talk more about that later when we have a close-up. And then on the floor is a work called end-to-end -end encrypted, parentheses, Lot's wife. Um, can you pull the next slide up, please? Cool, and then this is the other half of the room. Uh, you can see Hugh, the wall color, extends to the third wall, and this is the other work in the placeholder series, Blood and Blue. And next slide. Great, uh, so this is a detailed shot of end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, Lot's wife. Um, so this piece sort of came from me 
processing sort of a, a sense of loss or sort of a, a sense of transformation coming through a relationship that I couldn't keep because of distance through COVID. Um, like pre-COVID, I was dating um, a couple that lived in a different state and sort of had in my mind was thinking that I could travel back and forth. But once travel shut down, sort of all of our connections were limited to any contact that we could have through the computer, um, specifically WhatsApp and a lot of three-way phone calls. So that's kind of where the title comes from, end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, if you use WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or any of these services, it's basically a technology that the companies use that kind of convince people that your personal data is somehow safe, which is, is dubious at best, but <laughs> oh well. Um, and then the second half of the title, Lot's Wife, is a direct reference to the biblical story um, about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah where um, angels come and basically warn Lot and his family that um, they're going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and they have a chance to sort of pack up and leave, but the only rule is that once it starts, they can't look back. And so famously, the whole family packs up, you know, Lot, um, their children, but Lot's wife is the only one who's sort of so overcome by emotion or sort of seeing her home destroyed, looks back over her shoulder and sort of as a punishment is turned into a pillar of salt. So for this sculpture, the base that the clothes are sitting on is actually my exact body weight in um, rock salt. So you can kind of think of it as like my, my flesh being calcified by this moment of trying to look back and grab onto a piece of my past that I can't access anymore. And I've sort of like obliterated myself a little bit in the process. Um, and one last thing about the clothes too. Um, the only aspect of this work that's not actively visible to visitors at the museum is that I actually sang a love song um, to these people through the internet wearing these exact clothes. So this is kind of like the last thing that was touching my skin before now it's forever attached as a sculpture pinned to the ground and also lit um, really dramatically and sort of it takes on this sort of like ghastly quality or almost reads a little bit like a reliquary. Um, and will also live on forever, like through my lifetime and also afterwards, like as a sculpture and kind of as a way to bookmark this moment in time. Cool, next slide. Oh, uh, fun fact about, um, can we go back to the previous slide? Sorry. I actually, got this sweatshirt from you, Ron. You were wearing it um, at a panel talk at the Walker Art Center when we first met. <laughs> <laughs> I've had it Woo! for um, But now it's art, so you can't touch it. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is a detail of um, the video installation, which is called Supernumerary. Um, I'll start with the title of that work. Um, what's exciting to me about the name is that it comes from it's a theater term for basically anyone who's performing who doesn't have a speaking role. So classic examples of this are say if you have like a big European fancy court scene and you have like the jesters and like the market folk or whatever, but they're not the main characters that can speak. Um, all the people who are kind of filling up space or kind of performing these tasks are defined as supernumeraries. Um, and the reason I use that title for this work is because in this performance, I'm reading out an essay um, of all of my research about the Ed Buck murder case with Timothy Dean and Jamel Moore and sort of tying it into how my work as an artist and sort of unpack these digitally reproduced traumas and trying to think um, creatively of ways to sort of give these people back their voice. Because in my mind, Jamel Moore, Timothy Dean, and so many others that were abused by Ed Buck actually were the main characters of this story, but either through loss of life or through, um, excuse me, through very biased media coverage, it's kind of like they didn't get a chance to speak for themselves. So I could think of myself, or you could think of me as sort of like transmuting some of that energy and sort of trying to show some of this pain and sort of like wrongful death and people being taken advantage of like from the perspective of the people that didn't get a chance to speak up um, on the two sides of me uh, are the four musicians from jack quartet um, they're a new music group that plays um, all strings which kind of goes without saying is a very classical format traditionally right like if you think of chamber music you think of like classical standards um, but what I did unique for this performance is I had them transpose sounds that I made for my body these kind of like 
guttural grunts and yells. And then I attached each of the sounds to a hand gesture. So this is one, this is one, stomping my foot is another. And I sort of turned the string quartet into a ready-made in a way and used these gestures as a way to punctuate um, my reading of the text, um, which is actually available online. I'll have to drop it in the chat um, before we go. Um, as a way to kind of like reclaim this, this history and also kind of like reframe myself as like the author um, or kind of like the one sharing this information. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and then so this one, we have a um, person here for scale. So to their left on the floor is the work whole that I was talking about before. So I title this piece as a performance because before we opened the show to the public, I basically went in with a sledgehammer and just broke a hole in the wall of the museum. And then um, I worked um, with the install crew there to sort of create a lighting system that reveals as much of it as it hides. So it's a little hard to see from this photo, but basically if you bend down and try to look through the light, you're only gonna see sort of more of the wall. I purposely hid like all the electronics and also the way that it's sort of angled. If you bend down, you really can't get your head through and see the whole thing. So it's sort of giving you this promise of sort of like a, an access to the outside or like some other world or like another sculpture or something, but also like denying it. Um, and this sort of like screaming or sort of like beckoning towards the viewer while also not really giving a lot of way, uh, a lot of way, um, again, connects to my feelings of just uh, the intensity of sort of like pain and these sort of traumas being shared over digital space. It's like we're getting so much, but can you really summarize, you know, 55 years of someone's life into a hashtag? Or like, how do you explain like the gravity, you know, of someone being, you know, taken advantage of and like an infographic on Instagram? And it, I really kind of believe you can't. Um, to the right, uh, the red piece, placeholder series number one, nudity. Um, is again sort of like in direct reference to this sort of media feed that we encounter, uh, thinking about Instagram specifically and sort of how we're supposed to somehow get all of this valuable information through an image. So this sign is solid uh, aluminum. It's about like uh, seven by nine feet, this one. Uh, it's painted in red, and then on the back, or I guess along the middle, the word nudity is in this sort of uh, reflective vinyl, a similar vinyl that you would see on street signs. So the idea is sort of like at certain angles, the text pops out, and at other points, it sort of almost looks flush. Um, great. The next slide. And here's just the other half of the room. Um, same thing, placeholder series number two, blood, um, similar process with a color-matched vinyl and blue aluminum powder coated background and another person there for scale and then you can also see where the brown ends that piece hue um stops up against the lot white lots white piece as a way to kind of like draw attention to this this body that's sort of cast calcified in the floor all right we can just uh, click quickly through these next couple slides they're just details it gets an idea of the surface in that one Their close up. Cool. All right. So I mm -hmm. think um, if we can click out of the slides and I'll just chat with Ron for a couple of minutes. Thank you so much, Rob. <laughs> but yeah, that's uh, kind of what I've been working on this past year and trying to find a way to creatively translate my work and performance into still making work that's like about the flesh but can still exist in sort of like non-physical sense well i i do have some comments and questions because i think in my in my own practice i've always um justified my sort of ego to just say i'm going to work with a string quartet or i'm going to destroy architecture or i'm going to work with a dancer <laughs> like untrained as part of the kind of late 70s DIY fuck you punk aesthetic but you're a totally ge different generation than me but you're just doing it and you belong there um how, how do you face that um I mean I really feel 
in lineage with you and so many other people and sort of this DIY ethos in creating work. Um, and I think that, yeah, I, I guess I kind of, kind of relate to, to what you were saying. It's sort of everything that seemed too challenging or too confusing to do on my own. Like I just decided to do it. And then once I convinced myself that it was possible, I was able to get the support to yep. make it happen. Um, but I think one of the greatest lessons I learned through performance is that um, nobody really questions you if you do something and then have to talk about it afterwards. But if you try and get permission or explain it first, it's always way too hard or way too complicated or it doesn't make sense or the audience is gonna hate it. Um, so I, I think I'm really grateful to have learned through my own practice, but also learned through people like you and so many others and just being like, okay, like I can trust the impulse and you know, this, the, the live event is kind of my, my sketchbook or that's where the work comes from is through doing it. Yeah. You, you, but the, the, the freedom and the sense of belonging and, and other feels is there without self-consciousness, which is what un, undoes it. You know, there, there is an expertise and just the response. Um, the other thing, because I, I've been watching your work with lots of interest and, and um, enjoyed our relationship. And I, I feel the response to the, the horrible, like buck reality is the darkest I've seen you go, like to actually address a sort of a, a atrocity that resonates out as you said, in, in, into a bodily experience, even if you have nothing to do with anyone involved in those cases. It's just like the, the way um, the erasure of money can make a, a crime go on and on and on, and how many people are implicated in a way by receiving money from him be, be outside of the sex trade, but into the Democratic Party specifically. I mean, uh, can, can you say a little bit about how how you could um, not only take that on, but also name it. Uh, yeah, I think it is a really big problem. Um, and sort of it's something that really shook me to my core, sort of for the reasons that you mentioned, where it's sort of like it, it, the whole unfolding of the court case made it abundantly clear sort of who matters and who doesn't matter. And the fact that you could directly point to his support of like the Democratic Party at Vox or, and then how that trickles down through the police force and the people that sort of should be arresting this man. But it took not one death, not two deaths, but actually a third person who's in the police reports who's uh, self-identified as like a John Doe or a Joe Doe, they call him. Wow. Basically, he was having an overdose in Ed Buck's apartment where these other two men died. and had enough strength to physically crawl out of the apartment and get to a payphone and call the police. So essentially this man was kind of a glitch in the system, right? It's like the police wouldn't do anything when these black people were just dead, but it was one, it was the person who didn't die or was too alive to pretend that they couldn't listen to him. And that's when they brought the police. It's like, oh, now, now it's just getting sloppy. So we have to step in and do something. And it's, um, it is like a deeply bodily experience, right? It's a kind of trauma that moves just beyond headlines or just beyond sort of like current events. But um, I reached a point in my practice where I could kind of use the tools that I developed in my own work. And now I'm able to sort of like step out of myself a little bit and sort of use my background as a way to kind of like transmute this information and try and make it into something else or kind of point and ask questions more directly in a way where I've maybe been a bit more kind of obtuse or a bit more cagey in the past. It kind of reminds me of um, how a lot of people felt about Jeffrey Dahmer, even though the power struggle thing was completely different because he wasn't anyone important, but that it was um, bodies of color that were going down and it was one that actually survived the sunk the ship. Um, but just that realization of looking at someone thinking, could I have went off <laughs> with this motherfucker? You know, it, 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 it has a parallel with that of, of from my past of a news story that kind of like creeps you out on a deeper level than, than just the creepy facts of the story or the, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we meet people all the time, like especially, I mean, more of a pre-COVID thing, but, you know, living in cities, traveling, whatever, it's just like you're constantly surrounded by new individuals and like, what do we know beyond just like taking a chance, I guess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm glad you brought up Jeffrey Dahmer. It's sort of like Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't the first and, you know, unfortunately, like maybe Ed Buck won't be the last, but I hope by trying to like crystallize the story, like as it's happening, um, I can attempt to sort of break through sort of some of the, the filth and like kind of just wretchedness, I guess, of the situation. Yeah. Um, in the text, I actually, in the essay that I'm reading in the performance, I mentioned Octavia Butler, um, and specifically in the Patternist series, there's this amazing character called Doro, who's yeah. a body snatcher, and basically his skill, I'll call it, is basically he's able to enter the body of another person, but the problem is the, center, the second he enters their body, that soul is just erased, and so he's yeah. just like a puppet inside the flesh, and he can stay for as long or as short as he wants to, but the second he decides he needs he needs new flesh he can just jump into another person and the previous body is dead and i feel like that desire almost I, I really felt that reflected in the behavior of ed buck jeffrey dahmer and to be honest the way that media culture works now um we're sort of constantly taking pictures constantly taking images and trying to somehow distill like the breadth of human experience into like 180 characters or less and it's not possible yeah, wild status out there <laughs> for, for, for multi, multiple concepts going on between yeah. eugenics and, and also her shape-shifting sort of erotics. Yeah. Oh, yeah, shape-shifting. That's, that's another really good one, too. Like <laughs> this notion of like costume or like, um, it's like the last little bit I'll say before we move on, but like think about like TikTok too, or like this notion of like parroting, right? It's like you, the whole app is just based around sort of like ingesting like someone else's media and like reperforming it. And I mean, people do it in creative ways and some people do make original content, but these sort of like, they call them challenges, right? But the challenge is just like to the best of your ability, how close could you recreate something to the original? I, I don't know. It, it feels like the logic <laughs> of a virus, like somehow like play yeah. it's just like, through it, the people or through through the performance of like this digital media space it's hard <laughs> it's hard for me for my old brain oh, yeah. <laughs> that the references like speed up to where they're happening in real time instead of waiting for someone to die or become irrelevant at least to to take do a piss take of mm -hmm. yeah it's in real time for sure yeah <laughs> all right do you want to do you want to share some images Yes, I'm going to mow through. Well, I also happen to be in New York City um, during the winter <laughs> after um, four, kind of three or four stalling the dates of a retrospective um, curated by the art historian Amelia Jones of Participant Inc. We're over here on, on Houston um, doing an install today. Um, but I wanted to go through a few images that kind of read like, how do you do a 40 year retrospective of being a performance artist? So I'd like to start with the first image. Um, instead of starting with PE that I did with Roz Williams, I'll start in 83 because um, the band Nervous Gender was a huge influence on me and, and Roz and, and the project Premature Ejaculation, um, as, as well as Johanna Went was the original one. Um, I didn't know this photo existed until it appeared at the Museum of Sex in New York City. <laughs> so we did um, some performance for camera actions. Um, and rather than assume that whatever space I occupied, I invented myself, I, I feel it's important to bring in um, inspirations, collaborators. Um, and in my case, because I'm a you know, mostly self-educated artist, I came out of scenes. So these um, kind of um, small music scenes that were in underground in Los Angeles in the late seventies is when I first learned about this band and this even concept of what predated the word queer, you know, the, que the queerness of nervous gender as um, a kind of post pre or post punk band that used electronics. So this idea of psychoneuroacoustics within sound, um, 
using sexual identity as both um, a beautiful costume and a weapon against people that didn't belong within the clique. It, it was, you know, showing up at parties with guys in jock straps and stuff. So, and by 83, I, I was doing stuff with Edward. Um, if we move to slide two, um, that's a photo of um, Lee Bowery. And when Lee Bowery died in um, 95, um, Nicola Bowery gave me this velvet gown of his, which I've used in about five performances five performances, either one by myself or someone else. So I thought it was important to show that gown here on a um, dress form and you know, just the power of embodiment of the body that you have. Like I think Lee is still profound in that way. Um, so that gown appears in um, 95 at, at the ICA London premiere of Deliverance. Um, Juliana Snapper wears it in the 2004 performances of the opera, The Judas Cradle. Um, it's kind of a, if you need the biggest damn <laughs> velvet gown, that, that one's it. And, and I feel like its presence um, says a lot for, for the show, Queer Communion is, is the title of it. Um, image three is Crowns, that's um, Divinity Fudge and Pigpen, from, that's also from Deliverance. Um, and there's some new crowns from the um, Pasiphae, the Witch Queen of Crete that I made that's um, kind of in line with those crowns. So um, sometimes a, a character study for me for a performance starts with the costume. So the costumes aren't an aside or a more visual leftover. They're actually like the muse of, of the action. Like it starts with um, these kind of reflective stones or dissociative sparkle for me based on a character. Um, in, in that particular piece, Divinity plays like seven icons, go at, starting as the Buddha and Cosmos Shiva, you know, like kind of mows through it. Um, go to the next one is the Judas Cradle, which is also behind me. Um, and making this opera with Juliana Snapper, I, didn't, I wanted her to sing in it. She said, let me train your voice. <laughs> and so we did a duet. Um, but the Judas Cradle, when it was um, revealed in the Middle Ages, was supposed to be kind of a kinder, gentler form of torture that started adding sandbags to the legs. And of course, as torture goes, goes down that road. Um, so I also have that piece here, which, which is kind of um, fantastic to have. And also trying to mix um, my like kind of body actions with the sort of high art of opera and also looking at opera um, where it could go in a direction of what polemic is within opera, the way it's staged, what um, bloat can be in opera as like a, a gigantic art form that I still um, am excited about. And yeah, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but the collaboration both with Juliana Snapper and opera, opera povera, Sean Griffin, his is definitely one of my teachers and collaborators um, and, and more recently still doing voice work and recording an album with um, Carmina Escobar. So this is an exciting like sideways journey. I didn't ever know I would go down via the Judas Cradle. Um, the next image is a, a planchette which when I was living in England, I went to um, Manchester to meet with a psychic who made these objects, which um, the history of the planchette is the planchette was usually smaller and it was the pointer from a Ouija board. So when it started being used for automatic writing, a hole was drilled in it and a pen used. So automatic drawing, automatic writing, you know, also significantly the first surrealist project was an automatic novel. So automatism is, um, is part of my practice. It's something I always use in workshopping. It's something I always use in um, development periods of making a piece. And certainly when I feel a block, like I don't know what to do next with the scene because it's so, like I just hit a roadblock. I, I do automatic writing to um, move through that. So the, some of the earlier planchettes are, are included in this show as well as the, the work that was made from them. Um, the next one is 
of important icon to me, I call it the Holy Woman, where I embodied um, the evangelist Amy Simple McPherson, who used a cross between a nurse dress, um, military nurses, and of course a nun as a bride of Christ. So this white dress is trying to bring back the sort of majestic and voluptuousness on you know what after 26 years could you know I have to bring it back to life. So I'm working with um, prosthetics and, and a dress form to do that. Um, plowing through Gifts of the Spirit, the score of number six. Um, everything fancy on that is Sean Griffin. <laughs> we, a few years ago, we were in Guanajuato, Mexico, um, with a commission from the Mike Kelly Foundation working on turning uh, automatic writing installation that I showed in four cities into an opera. So the kind of, um, I would respond to questions or topics and automatic writing and he would turn them into a score for a string quartet, percussion and electronics. Um, if we go to number seven. Before the opera, this was the layout. This is in um, Manchester, England. It's Whitworth Hall, which I think some of the Harry Potter lunches are filmed. <laughs> um, but to just roll out all this paper and have 16 writers, six typists, two editors, four vocalists, you know, the, this kind of cast, that was a, you know, it's a very um, group project. And every, every time I did, I did it in London, Manchester, um, did it in New York City, also Birmingham and a, a new, you know, a never finished factory. It, it just kind of built up energy how a collectively authored text could then be using, you know, Burroughs Geising cut up technique to edit into a libretto on the spot. It was the challenge was to do all of this um, hard work within an hour and make a, a original piece from it. And that was also used in the opera. Um, we go to the next image, number eight. This is, um, you know, ephemera posters. This is Deliverance, the third part of the torture trilogy, which during the 90s, I was directly responding to the, the a HIV AIDS pandemic. Um, and we'll move on to the, a more hard hitting image from that series. Number nine is the, you know, slightly larger than life. Polaroid series I did with Catherine Opie here in New York City in 1999. Um, the Sebastiani, it's also included in a show at Kunsthalle Vienna called Sebastian, Sebastian A Splendid Readiness for Death. Um, that This was one of those images that stuck with me since the 80s really, that as I keep reinterpreting and showing and doing more research realize not only was he the patron saint of athletes, it's also the saint that you pray to in times of plague. Um, and then, then I feared at some point it became like the gay angel, like too saturated in the, in the, in the homoerotic depiction of it. Um, um, I plowed through those images. Those are some of the things I'm trying to either bring back to life or um, represent. This one is um, messianic remains. Joshua tree action, um, using a rope around a human body as a human compass to make a, a circle to start the performance on of the part two of it. I'm um, using what I call an appropriated text series. Um, the final paragraph in Jean Genet's Prisoner of Love is about the role of the witness and the coloration that his testimony brings to a, a truth. Um, and the final thing I would like to just show one video, which is um, also a piece that Elliot worked with us on. This was the Gifts of the Spirit Opera um, 2018. And um, the first cathedral in Los Angeles was the Cathedral of Vibiana. Um, of course, they had to bring Roman bones to LA in the mid 19th century to, to do a um, Catholic number on the city. <laughs> so. Well, um, in this space and in the altar, which was built in the 20s, so it has some profound, like white deco, white out sort of architectural flourishes too. It's like um, making it in a jewel box. And within that, um, something that's kind of a signature to larger group work I do is to build a room 
by the entrance of the cans. So I just want to show that that part of it. If we if you have that gifts of the spirit video handy, and then then I'd like to switch to a, to talking with Elliot about that and other works. Yeah. Um, well, I will talk about that video <laughs> since he was showing them um, in, in the piece I'm still touring called The Cephalus Monster, based on um, the secret society of Akathili that Georges Bataille and various people did. Um, the final scene is I use text um, with their blessing from Genesis P. Orge from um, early 80s writings called Esoterrorist. And the idea of animating word virus and having it move all over the screen was important to me. Also, like kind of, they gave me permission to kind of re-edit and cut up and, you know, as they had done to write some of that. Um, so that will be shining through um, the front window here, which has been treated to be a rear projection screen onto the street. So I added that. Um, Cool. Um, Ron, I had a question for you about, I guess, the role of text in your work. I think that's something that we both definitely share. Um, a lot of my earlier performances have a lot of like direct address talking to the audience and sort of you do a lot of speaking both with your own text, sort of uh, divined texts, and also the text of uh, scholars, writers, people from past and present. Sort of how do you view like the writing and thoughts of others kind of in relation to your, your performance practice? Um, yeah, I, I, when I first saw your work, I would describe you as a um, text actionist. <laughs> because, I accept that. Um, <laughs> I, I do feel like we have to evolve with text, like just writing a perfect monologue and, and reciting it or performing it or acting it isn't enough to me to move text forward. I think after cut up, after, um, I don't know, all, all kinds of experiments with text, like stream of consciousness, there's other ways to look at text. Um, I, I love appropriated text, just to be upfront that this text rattles my fucking world. When I hallucinate, I see a litany of it coming out solid out of my mouth and moving across the space. So to try to animate um, text or, you know, I, I don't think it's true to say that you never bend quotations. Of course, like Bible quotations are the biggest example of manipulated text. So to take a text that moved you in your way and even bring it to life more, whether that, you know, regardless of where that, where that text comes from, I think that's some of the premise of, um, even cut up writing what Geisen and Burroughs were using, which included like Scientology tracks, <laughs> psychotherapy tracks, you know, what, the, the, the condition that, you know, things that reflect on our condition. So um, I, I also love text as a texture. So I, I, I often um, create a set with, with projected text, with um, painted text, and, you know, and, and definitely plan to continue to, to work with that. And then the counterpart to that is glossolalia, is um, non-lingual text, like making noises that are spontaneous and do come from my like Pentecostal background, but also have evolved, um, especially in collaboration with other types of vocalists as a way of conjuring up emotions that, that words can't, you know, 
not just emotions, but there's also uh, um, speed. You can speed up the room with noise. Yeah, I, I love thinking about words as sort of a way not just to transmit information, but also to like uh, transmit emotion and feeling, which I guess through glossolalia or through the act of performing a reading, you can give language so much more potency um, and, uh, and bite, I guess, through the way that you're kind of sharing that information. Um, yes, to all of what you said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a quick question too, that sort of connects your work in the past to some things that are more contemporary now. Um, basically, what do you feel your relationship between crisis and transformation is? Like both from like a historical slash fantasy space, but also kind of like a lived experience and sort of how that relates to the genesis for each of your performances. Um, I, th I, I feel like the drama in the nine, you know, in late eighties and nineties in my life around the HIV AIDS pandemic, I didn't have to think about that. There was so much um, sickness and death and, and anger around politics and in, inaction and um, that it was like a, a fierce ride. Um, and, and now I, I don't um, look to look for that necessarily um maybe i look for it more historically like i look i always try to run things through a historic lens so when when was this addressed again you've been looking at um french groups you know pre and during world war ii like another time where shit hit the wall and how did um thinkers come together how did people bury the hatchet hatchet and, and work together or not you know, and, and, and certainly post World War II, how do people just come back into publishing another book? <laughs> um, you know, I guess you could always say, um, God, so much bullshit is going on right now. How can you just um, make a piece that's full of like faggotry and flamboyance? And you think, what's going on exactly? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I do feel like I am, um, rode the apocalypse ride for so long and i still i still feel it but also being a survivor i, I mean i'll be 60 this year i i also um d definitely look to joy and pleasure and jouissance and i don't know i i feel like that's the defiance sometimes not just to be a miserable angry motherfucker but uh, yeah <laughs> cheers cheers to that <laughs> <laughs> costumes New yeah. wigs. <laughs> yeah. Used to living well and for a long time as well. <laughs> cool. Well, I guess um, could take a quick pause for any exceptionally juicy questions from the chat, as decided by admin. <laughs> Bring it. Yeah. Our host. <laughs> us, us. Oh, sorry, no one heard that. Only you heard that. That's okay. Uh, so there were a few questions in there. Uh, Alicia is asking about the, uh, I guess, the role of pain in, in performance. Uh, and I, I would say, you know, I think, Elliot, you showed us um, this latest project that you're working on. But I think probably... You know, the most interesting thing I think that people would want to hear about is kind of the connections between maybe uh, both of your um, practices. And one of the questions related to pain and the other is related to kind of religion and religious imagery. So I wonder if maybe if I can just kind of synthesize a couple of the questions into a question about that crossover or how you see uh, maybe connections between your each of your uh, practices. Um, cool. I guess I'll, I'll start with that. I think that I've had a lot of different relationships to sort of pain, whether it's like doing things that are physically painful or like challenging on stage to now. And the work that I showed today is sort of like a, a way of me not just expressing my physical reaction to the 
the weight of the world, but kind of taking a step back and uh, trying to process it a little more. So in my installation, there's a lot of skin, like a lot of like literal and like metaphorical skin. Like the walls are stretched with my skin. The artworks are tearing through it. Um, I'm reading a story about, you know, death or kind of like the bodies of people that have been taken. Um, the sculpture on the floor is sort of of clothes that were touching my skin during a moment in time that I've kind of crystallized. So I feel uh, that this work that I'm doing now is kind of like my, my reaching towards a new way of thinking about the body in pain and also what it means to perform without being present in a way. Um, I kind of took myself personally out of answering that question, but I guess thinking about it through the art, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, Ron, what about you? Well, I, I do have a long ride with pain <laughs> and work and, and um, I, I do, pain is rich and it continues to evolve. I think in the early eighties, it was um, a defiance, just like about redefining pain. Like, I don't know, I think, the resonance of performances I heard about, like comb transmissions, like breaking glass and crawling through it, or, or you know, the subjects in Herman Nietzsche performances having like slaughtered animals strapped to their bodies while they're quasi crucified. Um, I started seeing, you know, obviously also overlaid this with religion that you have to sacrifice something or be this public, this. Um, figure sent up, which is similar to a primitive type of scapegoating. So the, the artist has the scapegoat or the artist has the central figure that sacrifice is, all, is always painful, but then what the hell is pain? Like we, we go through pain for all kinds of reasons and voluntary pain is so different than a life experience pain. Um, I think you know, idols of mine are, are different martyr saints. And you just say, like, all I did was give up my eyes for vanity. And, you know, I'm an eternal saint. Um, it's, it's, it's part of the price sometimes. And I don't necessarily mean mortification of the flesh. Also, um, Elliot, more things you were describing. Like, I've seen you climb a ladder with, like, 25 outfits tied to you while reading something, while something shredding through a fan, while, you know, like this, this um, kind of, beyond your human ability to juggle so you know that you're going to fail like this this also fits in that category of like pressing yourself beyond capability um i i think the the same thing with the endurance body um pain is also an entrance to trance and sometimes i think the ultimate performance state is out of body so whatever whatever takes you to trance whether it's meditating all day or you know, the way you address the material leading up to the actual performance, um, all, all, all of those things slide into it. Yeah, and uh, just to tie back to a project that we're doing too, um, thinking about this notion of like endurance or sort of impossibility, um, our performance we have coming up at uh, MoMA PS1 the 20... 20th. 20th, yeah, the 20th of February. Um, as part of a series that's about this sort of impossibility of performing in live space, um, sort of figuring out how to perform through multiple cameras without an audience and like trying to find a way to bring liveness in a space that liveness cannot exist. Um, yeah, impossibility, struggle. Um, I, know, I like that you brought those up. I'm still kind of chewing on it, but. No, that, that's a lot because um... I, I always um, describe an audience as the collective witness to, to look through a religious lens at it. And that um, now suddenly I'm not a televangelist. You know, I'm not getting a boner because I think how many people are watching this webcast, <laughs> but that trying to just like, I don't know, focus on you, Elliot, and um, also things that we have in practice, but there's also a disembodiment from it. Like, at least we're in a um, art space right now. Yeah. We're at, at Participant Inc. But sometimes, um, yeah, you can be in your, uh, like a hallway in your house with your phone on a little tiny tripod. Like, hi, 
<laughs> I'm doing this art chat, and um, for for me, I had to really rise up to that because I I I feel a wall of energy from live audience, and and I feel like that's always been a huge part of why I perform because I get my shit up on that. You know, it really feeds me and feeds the energy of the piece. So um, it was never so great at me. You know, I I think I I have been going into video making even before this time, which always accompanied live performance, but just in Los Angeles before coming here, we shot um, a video based on pa the myth of Pasiphae, the witch queen of Crete, mother of the Minotaur and a glory hole origin story um, to, to kind of make a project during this time was also very difficult. Um, performance for camera always has like a fake feeling for me, whereas, um, perfect images caught during performance feel different. Um, I'm changing, but not that much. <laughs> I'm drinking, <laughs> drinking through it. Yeah. Doing our best. <laughs> Yeah. Me, sorry. I I told everyone we were going to be full of technical problems today. You can hear me. They couldn't hear me. Uh, I was just saying. I think it's a, a great place to stop actually because it's kind of leaving us thinking about, um, you know, what everyone's thinking about. I think all the artists that are in that are tuning in right now, just kind of how we operate, especially with performance in this mode where we're operating without an audience, and um, it, it's kind of. Uh, you know, there's a lot to think about. And, and then on top of that, thinking about uh, this, this struggle with not being, not succumbing to just kind of being consumed by neg negativity, but also kind of thinking about pain and that kind of experience and how this all, all kind of relates um, in this moment, I think. Um, yeah. But thanks to both of you. I'm going to put you back on. I don't, oh, actually, they can hear you. They can hear you, but I'm going to put you back on uh, so they can see you. And thanks again, and everyone, uh, thank you for being in the live stream and the chat, and we'll also see you for the next event. Uh, I'll, I'll post the, um, the date for that in a moment, but let's get back to uh, Ron and Elliot one last time. Um, I, just, I really want to thank Elliot for inviting me to have this discussion. Um, lo love him personally and the practice and just, even though everything's virtual, we're doing, somehow we have three events together in, in New York that none of them are live, even though they're live. <laughs> but we gotta explore and play and, and laugh and wa wonder what it all adds up to. I think it, um, even that connection alone makes it worth it for me. Yeah. Oh yeah, Ron, I love and adore you so much. And I'm really glad that we've been able to stay friends and work together for so many years and I hope to continue all, all everything more. Um, but I'm excited, We're, I'm performing in, um, as part of your opening for here at Participant on the 16th. 16th. Yeah, and that's gonna be, is that online? That will be um, reachable through the Participant's website. Yeah, and then we're doing an hour improvised together at MoMA PS1 that's available on their website on the 20th of February. So <laughs> a little like mini New York tour or something. Yes, <laughs> yes we are. Well, now we're in Florida. <laughs> we're not in New York right now. I forgot. We, we flew from Florida to New York and then we're going to finish. <laughs> but without, it's an honor to be here. But without defrosting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you. It's been great. And thanks for also for letting us know where to uh, find these performances online. So we'll be looking out and uh, take care, everybody. Thank you. Brilliant.